Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Can you still play games in 2019 on a four core, four thread processor? How about the latest AAA games like The Division 2, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey? How about slightly older games that want high frame rates? Well, we're gonna take a look at that today with 25 new benchmarks on the 2018 $800 i3 8350k build links in the video description below to all of that with an upgraded graphics card this machine was built with a gtx 1050 ti and it now has a gtx 1070 ti does that make it a powerful gaming machine or are you better off with something with more cores and threads such as the upcoming zen 2. i am recording this a week before ryzen 3000 launches and yes, most of you should go buy that instead. I am not making this video because I still think most of you should build a machine like this. The upcoming Ryzen 5 3600 will probably make this chip pretty pointless in terms of price to performance, clock speed, even individual cores. It'll be pretty close. Even though this CPU is overclocked to 4.8 gigahertz, and it does perform very, very nicely. Instead, this video is being made for two reasons. Number one, some of you might simply find it interesting. What is possible to do with four cores and four threads in modern AAA games in 2019? And some of you own such a CPU. Now, you may not own this specific CPU. However, if you have an i5-7600K or an i5-6600K, and those are overclocked to 4.8 or close 4.5, 4.6, is it worth putting a GTX 1070 Ti, or if you prefer, an RX Vega 56 or an RTX 2060? Those are all about the same performance. Is it worth buying such a card, upgrading your machine, and continuing to use it for another year or two, or do you just absolutely have to upgrade? So in that regard, it's meant to be informative to those users, and I hope all of you find it enjoyable. In just a minute, I'm going to have all of the benchmark footage on the screen, about 30 seconds per test to keep this video from being half an hour long, and then I've got charts for you showing the overall performance. I mentioned that the build video series of this is linked in the video description below. The actual build and construction of it, the first round of benchmarks, which were done with the GTX 1050 Ti, the overclocking video is down there, and a few others. I'm also gonna put another build series down there. The recent Ryzen 5 2600X build will be down there. If you're interested in the upcoming Ryzen 5 3600 or 3600X, you can follow that build video and just replace the processor. Everything else there pretty much stays the same in terms of price to performance. The component costs have come down a little bit, so you can actually get a little bit more for your money or build it for less than I did when I built that machine, but that's a good build guide to follow if you're interested in building one of the new Zen 2s. As I mentioned, we are running the CPU at 4.8 gigahertz fixed clock speed. There's no throttling or AVX offset set. 1.39 volts was necessary to get that to run smooth and stable. As you'll see from the temperatures in just a minute, temperatures are not a limitation. It would not run at five gigahertz, even with much higher voltage, or at least as high as I was willing to turn it. And it wasn't temperature limited. It wouldn't post at five gigahertz. So that 120 millimeter cooler you see right there, this Corsair H50, is really all that you need to cool a CPU like this. Oftentimes you're not temperature limited. You don't need a 360 millimeter liquid cooler. You're just voltage limited, just won't go any faster. But overall, it's a very nice, quiet, well-performing system. The benchmarks you're about to see were recorded externally on a second computer using a hardware capture card, and MSI Afterburner provides the real-time performance numbers that you're gonna see on the screen. Before we get into the benchmarks themselves, I do wanna give all of you a really big disclaimer. You're seeing the single-player offline performance in these games, not the multiplayer performance. Some of them don't have a multiplayer mode, but if you're interested in playing Battlefield 5 multiplayer, 64-player online conquest, if you're interested in playing Call of Duty Black Ops 4, four cores and four threads is not enough. I know this, I've played with it. Those games will use upwards of 12 plus threads, and if you don't have them, they will not be very smooth. Interestingly enough, if you just look at benchmark charts, if you look at frame rate charts, 
Battlefield 5 multiplayer looks fine on CPUs like this, but it doesn't play fine. Upgrade to an 8 or a 12 thread processor and it's smoother. There's less micro stutter built into the frame pacing delivery. It's easier to aim, it's easier to control your character, and the overall experience is just nicer. So if you're interested in such experiences, yes, you do need an upgrade regardless of what you currently have this or one of the previous i5 overclocked chips. But if you're interested in story games, offline games, if you're interested in non-intensive multiplayer games, then you might find this does pretty well. Watch very carefully the CPU usage when you see these benchmarks. A number of them do not hit 100%, but a number of them do. What that essentially means is that we are approaching the end days of when new games are functional on a CPU like this, which is why I said I'm not encouraging you to go buy it, but if you have one, yeah, you might still be able to get some life out of it. Anyway, that's enough talking from me. Let's take a look at some benchmarks. First up, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Take a look at that CPU usage. 100% usage. We are CPU bottlenecked. Notice the graphics card has come off 100%. It's in the 80 to 90% range. Still great performance. Look at that. We're over 70 frames per second. Just be aware in really busy areas, heavy combat with a lot of characters on screen, you may notice more stutter. This is an example of a game that really wants more than a four core, four thread chip. It will do it, but it's got its limits. Then we go to Civilization VI, a game famous for needing lots of CPU performance. In fact, it has a built-in CPU benchmark. However, in this particular case, notice the CPU is not at 100%. This game will certainly run just fine on this CPU. Although, of course, more is always better, especially in top-down strategy games such as this. However, I'd like to point out that we're at 100 frames per second, so it certainly is just fine. Next up, we have Warhammer Dawn of War 3, and wow, look at that frame rate. We're over 144 frames per second at times. Well, not there. See how much it drops down? This is why I show you these live recordings rather than just benchmark charts. It lets you see how much that frame rate really does vary. We're still a little bit CPU bottleneck, though, because notice the graphics card keeps coming off of the 99%, so it is a limit, but not a tremendous one. Moving on to F1 2017, 200 frames per second. Wow. So it certainly does want lots of cores and threads. Notice that the usage up there is in the 80 to 90% range, but it certainly doesn't matter for the performance. It's spectacular. It is very easy to focus on just the most demanding games like Assassin's Creed Odyssey and forget that a lot of people don't play Assassin's Creed Odyssey. They play F1 2017 or they play other games that simply don't need it which is one of the reasons why I made this video. How about the updated version? This is F1 2018. This is the first time I'm publishing a benchmark with F1 2018 in it, and it's a little bit slower than 2017. I was curious, it's not a huge difference. It's probably the same game engine with a few tweaks. 160, 170 frames per second. This thing is running like a champ. This also demonstrates the value of putting a high-end graphics card even in a relatively modest machine. Now, I would not normally recommend a GTX 1070 Ti, at least not back when they were $450 on an i3, but today when they're closer to $250, it's not such a bad proposition. Now, Far Cry 5 is in the same position as Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It runs, and the frame rate's amazing, but notice the CPU is pegging 100% at times. The graphics card, however, is still holding its own. Get into busy firefights, get into 15 characters on the screen and lots of stuff going on, and it is going to suffer a little bit of frame rate slowdown, but it is still very playable. What about Far Cry New Dawn? Well, frankly, it's the same game engine and really the same game with an expansion that they're selling you, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, offering for additional sale. <laughs> it's... It's a continuation of the original story, so it's the same engine. Frame rate's amazing. It is very easy to talk about frame pacing and CPU overloading, but look at that. We're doing 100 frames per second in Far Cry New Dawn on an i3. Who'd have thunk that was possible? Moving on to Final Fantasy XV. Now this is the benchmark, and I recognize the benchmark has received its fair share of criticism, but we're not doing Intel versus AMD comparisons. We're just looking at absolute performance. And I don't know about you, but for a graphically demanding game like this, 70 frames per second isn't bad. 
The CPU is not the limit here. The graphics card is. Want more performance? Get a better graphics card. This thing is absolutely brutal. A 1080 Ti is not overkill for 1080p gaming on this one. How about For Honor? For Honor's uh, getting an upcoming and expansion pack. 150 frames per second, CPUs at about 50%. That's not bad, and it demonstrates that cores and threads only matter when you run out of them. The extra cores and threads aren't being used most of the time. As much as I have waved the flag and said, eight cores and 16 threads is the future, it is. But that doesn't mean you have to throw out four core thread chips today, as this video, I think, quite aptly demonstrates. This is the first chart of those first games that we tested. Final Fantasy XV and Assassin's Creed Odyssey were around 80 frames per second. The Far Cry games and Civilization VI were 100 to 115, and then everything else went much, much higher. Raise your hands if you expected this much frame rate and relatively smooth frame rate. There was no uh, jerkiness or no stutter in any of those benchmarks. I think they ran really, really well. Next up, we have some more games. We have Ghost Recon Wildlands. I've beaten this game. I've live streamed this game. This is a whole pile of fun. Take a look at the CPU usage up there. It's intense, but this is playable on a four core, four thread chip, at least in single player mode. If you actually got online with three other buddies into a squad, I imagine it would run slower and you want more cores and threads. But yeah, it certainly will do the job. There'll be a little bit of micro stutter in there, but not so much as to make it unplayable. Now, Grand Theft Auto V is a weird situation because its built-in benchmark actually runs too fast for this hardware. Notice that the graphics card's at about 50%. It's overpowered. Grand Theft Auto V is five plus years old, and I really probably shouldn't benchmark it anymore, but I just wanted to show you just how ludicrously fast it runs. In fact, parts of the benchmark actually stutter because it runs into the engine limits of, of Grand Theft Auto V. Now we do a game I've never benchmarked before, Metro Exodus. This is the very first time I've tested this. I've gotten a couple of requests for it. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. This is very demanding. Look at that. We're just above 60 frames per second at 1080p high detail. Brand new AAA games are very demanding. This is a GTX 1070 Ti. Not that long ago, people would have said, well, that's a 1440p card. Not anymore. It's not. Look at that. We're down into the 40 frame per second range there, but that's the graphics card more than the CPU. Rainbow Six Siege, 200 plus frames per second. No issues whatsoever. This game is relatively easy to run. I would call this an esports game, even though it's a, a beautiful game, because of the fact that it's an online competitive multiplayer game in the vein of Overwatch, which would also run at 200 frames per second on this hardware. Both the graphics card and the CPU are very well utilized. You should get great, great performance out of this particular game. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the third installment in the rebooted series. Very graphically intense, very demanding. Look at that. We're using over five gigabytes of VRAM, and it really does use it all. In fact, it uses more in some parts of it, so definitely get an eight gigabyte card if you want to play this game. Look at the uh, performance, 80 frames per second, 1080p high detail on a relatively modest CPU and what is now a mid-range GPU, a 1070 Ti. You can get these for under $300. That's pretty good. Strange Brigade, I covered this at E3 about a year ago, 140, 150 frames per second. CPU usage is fairly modest. This game is not overly demanding and you can certainly get absolutely spectacular performance. Look how pretty it is. You don't have to have overkill hardware. I really wish game developers would optimize their games a bit more because that's really pretty and it certainly is not running at 80 like Assassin's Creed Odyssey was. Moving on to The Division, one of my favorite games of the past few years. I have beaten this game. I have recorded videos on this game. I have live streamed this game. In the normal single player mode, four cores and four threads is enough. I, it would be nice to have eight. There's a couple places in boss battles. The end battle especially is absolutely insane. It would be nice to have more, but you could totally play this game single player. If you go to the dark zone and you want to do multiplayer, there is intense PVP in this game. I wouldn't use the CPU. In PVP, you're definitely gonna want more. Same thing for The Division 2. Single player will run fine. The actual gameplay, running around the streets, playing against bots, playing the story, 
An, a four core, four thread chip is plenty, but I would not play multiplayer in either of the division games on a four core, four thread chip. You'll get a lot of jumpiness and a lot of micro stutter. It is, however, a beautiful game. Look at that poor Air Force One that I don't think will ever fly again, but it, it's very, very smooth at 100 plus frames per second. World of Tanks, 144 frames per second, no big deal. It really only uses about two or three cores, a four core, four thread chip for World of Tanks, World of Warships, War Thunder, League of Legends, CSGO, Dota 2, pick any of those games. They all run fine on a four core, four thread chip. And an absolute beautiful game. The recent 1.0 graphical upgrade really made a difference. It definitely looks much, much nicer, even if it does now require just a touch more graphics card. Here is the second of three charts. We're going to show you some more here in a minute. Ghost Recon Wildlands, 100 frames per second. Grand Theft Auto V, frankly, this computer is overkill for it. Metro Exodus was the slowest of all of these at 67 frames per second. Point out, that is a GTX 1070 Ti graphics card, 1080p high detail. Yeah, this is now a mid-range 1080p graphics card. It wasn't a couple years ago, but it is now. The rest of them, Strange Brigade, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, The Division, The Division 2, all run very, very, very nicely. Bonus surprise, we've got 3D Mark's Time Spy benchmark. This is not a game, it is a synthetic benchmark designed to determine DirectX 12 performance. We'll run Fire Strike for DirectX 11 in a minute. The main reason to include these numbers is it gives all of you something easy to compare against. You can run 3D Mark on your own machine and basically the top score wins. How well does your machine run? How well does this machine run? You can figure that out yourself. Again, I'm only cutting these short and showing you about uh, 30 seconds of each because otherwise the video would be long. I thought about just putting in the benchmark chart and not even showing you this recording. After all, uh, I don't have MSI Afterburner running. I want it as pure of a benchmark as possible and having MSI Afterburner up there, it takes something away from it. So leaving it off just lets you see the pure performance. But you can see the real-time frame rate on the bottom in the center of the screen there. It's about 75 frames per second at least at this part in the Fire Strike benchmark. I had to pick out the section that ran for about 30 seconds. Here's Skydiver. Now Skydiver is older and frankly, it's probably overkill for this machine. But since we have a GTX 1070 Ti in here instead of an RTX 2060, I couldn't run the new Port Royale RT, uh, ray tracing benchmark, which is the new thing included in 3D Mark. And I was debating, well, do I do the Fire Strike 4K test? Do I do Fire Strike Extreme? Do I run, you know, I wanted to do three because three was kind of a round number. I don't know, it was something to do. Then we're gonna run VR Mark. How well can you play VR games on an i3-8350K with a GTX 1070 Ti? I suspect you can play most of them very, very well. Completely depends upon the game, of course, but if you wanna play Beat Saber or Star Trek Bridge Commander or I, my brain's sitting here racking through trying to think of what are the VR games that everyone's playing? To be completely honest, I haven't kept up with it as much as I probably should have. So that was Orange Room. This is Cyan Room, and Blue Room will be up in just a second. Yes, it's kind of weird with both of them on the screen, but it's testing drawing both slightly different images at the same time, which is what you do with a VR headset. You'd have two, uh, basically the same image, but from a slightly different perspective to give you that 3D VR effect. And so the computer has to calculate it twice effectively, although it's off the same data set, so you would think or hope that it would run very, very well. We keep meaning to do some content on VR. Let me know in the comment section below whether or not you want to see us do anything with VR and do you want to see gameplay reviews? Do you want to see game reviews, benchmarks? Do you want to see uh, setup and configuration? What is it about VR that you're interested in seeing? We have an Oculus Rift. They just came out with a new version of that. If you're interested in seeing it, let us know. If you think VR is dumb and stupid, let us know that as well. There is a member exclusive video that shows us going to the Microsoft store and playing with VR, which was really, really cool. Beat Saber is cool, and we actually demoed two different games there. There's that video is there if you're interested. We took the whole family. It's neat. I don't know if it'd be neat for hours on end or if it was neat for 15 minutes in the Microsoft store. Here you can see the scores. I'm not going to read them to you. Compare them to your own machine and see whether it's faster or slower than this. 
Last but certainly not least, here is the benchmark results for PC Mark 10. This is a free download. You can go run this yourself on your own machine. And I put this shot up here just so you can see all the scores and all the numbers and compare them to yours if you're interested. Well, that was a lot of testing and a lot of benchmarks. Now, a few of those there at the end are not games per se, 3D Mark, VR Mark, etc., but it gives you an idea of what this machine can do. And those are tests that you can certainly run on your own machine and do a very nice direct comparison. As I said at the beginning of this video, I am not, and of course, I know I'm going to get comments in the comment section. What are you doing a video of this on in 2019? Yes, I know. But a lot of people still own these chips and want to know, what can I do with it? Should I upgrade my graphics card? Do I have to throw my computer out? And I wanted to do a video that basically said, you don't have to throw your computer out. You just may not be able to play 100% of all the games out there. You might only be limited to 99% of them. You are excluded from a couple performing really, really well. But the vast, vast majority of gaming experiences out there will run really, really well on a build like this. So if you already have one or you pick one up cheap, no, you don't have to get rid of it. You can keep enjoying it for a bit longer. If you are building new, Ryzen 5 3600 is $199, six cores, 12 threads. And while its individual per core performance won't be quite as high as this, it's superior to Ryzen 2000 and it'll be close enough for most people. That'll make far, far more sense. This is $170, that chip is 200, but that comes with a cooler and this doesn't. So all things considered, the Ryzen 5 3600 will be a better deal, and I'll be reviewing that very, very soon, as soon as it comes out. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please like it, share it with your friends, subscribe down below, hit that bell notification icon to be notified when new videos come out. Please consider joining the Deal Nation with the join button next to the subscribe button if it's available in your region. There are exclusive member videos and some live stream benefits and some emojis and a few other benefits. And of course you directly support the channel when you hit it. There's a comment section below, links in the video description, link to this full build series, link to the Ryzen 5 2600X build series, which as I said before, will be just fine for using as a guide towards the 3600 or 3600X. And then all my various social media links down there, Twitter, Twitch, Discord, etc. Thank you all so much for watching this. I will see all of you next time.